I am so glad that the Lord had led me to put out a lot of information. I understand and know that it is so much. That's why there's so many videos. Uh, and there's so much information in even one of them. And, you know, uh, depending on what you're looking for, what you want to understand, you might think it's a, a little bit much. But uh, in a time, ever since I can remember, people in power and control do not want you to know anything. Whether it is in a church, you know, <laughs> the church I came from, uh, and I'm not saying I came out of it because my parents and my grandparents went to it. I didn't go to it. But in that church, only the priests could read the Bible. Only the nuns and the priests could do certain things and think certain ways. But that Bible was written for every single man or woman on this earth. Then men come along and only men could have it. It's unbelievable. And even to a point where I had a woman look at me because my daughter at the time, nine years old, had a close relationship with God. And she said, shame on you. Your child loving God that much. <laughs> you stop and think about it. Well, if my child didn't love God that much, he never would have been able to take her when she got older. And uh, to me, elderly is 55 plus. Anyway, uh, but I think about how so many of us were kept in the dark, no matter who it is that they can study and and have everything and, and people like us are nothing, you know, uh, and how God comes and he takes nothing and he turns it into something. He takes literally nothing and he makes it something. If you don't have wisdom and you don't have power, he will use it to prove that he can give anybody wisdom and power. And it is an amazing thing to me that God operates like that and thinks like that. He knows when you strive towards him and you can't seem to make it because you have so many things to try and knock you down. Well, you can use that as your excuse to why you can't get up. So you could wallow in it, feel sorry for yourself, not make anything out of yourself. Some men, they go into alcoholism, feel bad for themselves because they had every opportunity and didn't use it. But they feel sorry for themselves. Anyway, it's everybody else's fault. Or you can go into drugs where all you think about is feeling good, and doing things. Or you can go into the evil parts of the world and just do everything and say, I don't have to do anything. I'm going to do what I want to do. And that's just the way it is. You, you can be stupid. <laughs> you, can, you can do things to destroy your own life. But a lot of you not only destroy your own life, but you destroy the life of those around you. Fortunately, we serve a great, big, wonderful God. One that will come along and like he said, he'll, if he sees you and finds you in your own blood, he picks you up. He nourishes you. He loves you. He strives to help you. He'll wash you up and clean you up inside and out, and give you the grace and power to be anything that you want to be. It doesn't matter what anybody says or what anybody thinks or what anybody does. None of that matters. The creator of all of life thought enough of you that he died for you. And when he thought so much of you that he took the time to separate you so that you could be made holy. That's sanctification. You can't pray it 
with somebody else praying over you. You can't get that by somebody else praying. You'll get a beginning of it. You'll get a touch from it. But you have to go with God on a journey by yourself. Just you and him. You are the one that has to make that choice. No matter how somebody prays over you. All somebody can do when they pray over you and lay their hands on you. All they can do is give you who they are. Give you what they think, what they feel. So if they're wrong and they are deceiving and or deceived or deceptive, they're giving you a part of themselves. And whether you know it or not, that'll hinder you for the rest of your life if you do not get it out. Because if you don't take the time to be holy before God, you have no idea of what comes through the air, what comes through people, what comes through different things that you read, things that you sit in front of, things. You have no idea. It is a tremendous amount of things that captivate you and take you on different rabbit, down different rabbit holes. And when you begin to realize it and you wake up out of it, you begin to dig deeper to find the truth. But you see, sometimes, depending upon the things that happen to you, it seems like it's a never-ending journey. You no sooner get rid of one thing than you have face another and you face another. But I'm here to tell you there is an end to that road. And the end of that road with God is joy, peace, long su suffering. All the things that you need as a Christian are at the end of that road. So if you search out all the things that happen to you beyond your control that motivate and make you who you are today, if you search that out and put, take it before God and get it erased under the blood of Jesus Christ, and then you find another thing and you do that, there comes an end. There comes a time that you're dead and that you no longer pick anything else up. You no longer think any other way. I was talking to a young man uh, about your eye being single. And he was saying, oh, well, you know, some people say uh, it's the third eye. It's the spiritual eye. <laughs> well, I never think those things. That's all flesh. That's all deception. That's None of that is true. The single eye that God was talking about, if thine eye be single, is the sole purpose in everything that you are, is God. So if you have a single eye towards God, with God, of God, always wanting God, always being with God, always going with God, and wanting only one purpose, and that is his will. Just one. It's single, very single. It's straight line. It's walking the straight path. It's, ooh, it is straight and narrow. And few there be that find it. And the reason for it is, is it because the flesh wants to be king or queen. The flesh wants to be in control. The flesh likes its pleasure, enjoys things that it should not enjoy. The flesh, they want to be seen. They want to be heard. They want to be understood. When you find yourself in a position that you sit down, and, and I did it many times when God corrected me, even as far as yesterday, I walked into a room and I, and I, uh, I went to go say something, and I saw God go, because he had just told me there's certain things, don't say them. Be still. There's no purpose to say it. No reason to say it. I had to learn how to hear that. I had to learn and ask myself before I spoke, what purpose would saying something do? Would it change that mind? No. Would it create this? No. 
Would it comfort me? No, it has no purpose. You see, saying something just to be saying it or to prove that you know something or prove you understand something, why bother? Who cares if anybody else knows you understand? Who cares? I had to learn. God would say, I can remember walking into a, a large Bible study class and I sat down. I understood everything the pastor said, uh, other people said, everything. And they're asking for answers and searching for answers and claiming that they're looking for the answers. And the Lord in me had the answer to everything, everything. There was not a single question I could not answer. And I knew far more than anybody sitting there. And I went to go rise up and, and give my answer. And he's, no, you are not here to show people how much you do know because you can do that, but that's not what you're here for. I sent you here so that you could see how they treat me, what they do with me, how they think and feel so that you could help them. You may even help them when they don't even know it. But it has nothing to do with anybody thinking you are something. Because your mind and your purpose has to be single-minded. His purpose. I was there for his purpose. I was there to learn what he wanted, what he said, what he thought. I already knew a lot of things. But I wasn't there to prove anything. But if I wanted to be seen, wow, I mean, they would have been, they would have been floored. But that isn't what God wanted. It was unimportant to God if anybody knew that I knew anything. That was totally unimportant to God. What was important to God is he had a plan to use me with other people who were just like these people. Some were deceived, some were ignorance, some would, whatever. He wanted me to learn how to reach them, learn what they didn't know, learn how to bring them out of where they were at in order to help them to see him as he really is. It was amazing to me that no matter where I went, no matter what I did, God was always, it's not time yet. Oh, I can remember not too long ago, a few years back, where I went and prayed a certain way, and he just, and oh, it was very, very powerful. And he just stopped me and he said, Marion, it's not time yet. There is going to come a day in your life that you're going to be doing this, but not today. I had to learn submission. I had to learn patience. I had to learn truth i had to learn because you see if i would have been like so many oh i got it oh after i fasted and prayed six weeks and i got all the answers and i can help anybody i'm a preacher and i'm this and i'm that and i went through this school and i went through that and they run ahead of god because it's not enough to be anointed is not enough to have wisdom is not enough. To have strength and power and understanding is not enough. None of it is enough. If that is all you have. Because you must have Jesus Christ in his fullness. If you only have a piece of him, you might as well have nothing. Because a piece of him is not enough. If he only has a piece of your heart, it's not enough. But walking and talking with him and learning with him and receiving wisdom, receiving power with him to do whatever he calls you. You don't know where you're going. You don't know what you're doing. You don't know why. You don't know what he has in mind. But you follow him. Why? Because he said, come, follow me. I will make you 
what you need to be. Come, follow me. So as you live one day at a time and you deny yourself and you work and labor with him and you, you learn how to use the words of knowledge that he gives you, you learn how to seek out and search for God, you learn an individual relationship with him that just grows and grows and grows. You learn that. And you don't dare use it ahead of time because you know you'll fail. You know God has proved to you beyond a shadow of a doubt that the reason why this one went for 30 years serving God and run off with a Sunday school teacher and the reason why this one after 20 or 30 years of being a woman of God well known in the area that there was no one like her finally leaves her husband and has a boyfriend. <sighs> Mind-boggling, mind-boggling that people can do that after walking and talking with God and Him revealing things to them, give, knowing the mysteries and the secrets of God, and then one day they just don't want Him anymore. They just they they wanted this deep inside their heart because their purpose was not single. Inside the evil imagination of their heart, like that one woman, she lived for a day where she would have another man who would treat her differently than what her husband was doing. She was just putting up with him. She just was enduring him. She was not helping to change him. She wasn't leading him to Jesus Christ. What she was doing was overcoming him, destroying him, and then dusting her feet off on him. She was the only one that had God in her family. And look what happened to her. And I can guarantee you that husband she left was free then to find somebody who would do the right thing with him. Everybody thinks the grass is always greener on the other side until you get there. And when you get there... <laughs> You're so dumb, you don't know what to do with it. I don't mean that as an insult. I mean that being ignorant about God and the things of God. What made you fail here so that you never fail here? What made you make this decision so that you never make a bad one again? What gave you the understanding that this was going to work this way so that you never have that understanding again? Because if life doesn't teach you, for Jesus is the truth, the life, and the way. If life in God does not teach you what not to touch, what not to do, how to change, you carry the same old baggage of who you are, and you're blaming everybody else. Well, it's all his fault, because if he wouldn't have done this, I would have never done this. It's all her fault, because if she wouldn't have done this, I'd have never done that. There's no difference between them and the man that beats his wife and says, well, if you wouldn't have opened your mouth, I'd have never hit you. Well, if you wouldn't have gone over here, I would have never done that. There's no difference. It's the same spirit. You follow the same spirit that's coming against you. <laughs> like the young man I was talking to. And uh, he's had parents of a religion that he knows is wrong. And when he would speak to them, he spoke to them in the same spirit. They would speak in control, trying to force what they believed on him. And because he defended himself, then he spoke exactly the same way. It would have been better to zip it and let God handle it. Because you're actually, when you are arguing, that's why God does not like debate. And the word of God should never be argued over. He doesn't like that because he knows it's not good for you. It isn't because he sits there, I don't want this and I don't want, he has reasons. He doesn't like you arguing the fact. Because he knows that if you would just leave that situation alone, 
and talk to God and leave it in the hands of God, if you would just do that, then you would see the wisdom of God in it. So you give out what you're getting and you think you're answering it. So then the scripture says, be ready to answer every man for what you believe. Okay, so what you do is, is you begin to argue. Somebody comes over to you, tells you how they think and feel. Instead of you just letting that go and, 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 you know, you, you can confess, well, this is what I believe. But once they will not accept it, then you stay completely away from them. You walk away. You walk away with love. You don't dust your feet. Who do you think you are? That you can literally act like an apostle or a disciple when you don't know anything. Well, they didn't receive me, so therefore they're going to pay. Oh, I cannot tell you how evil that is in the sight of God. I cannot tell you how you are so foolish that you could think this way and, and be this way and not have any knowledge to reach anybody. And when they don't accept what you don't have, then you get angry and say, I'm going to dust my feet off on them. And it's like you're casting a spell on them. They're going to pay. Oh, my goodness. Very few people have that power to do that. Because they have to be 100% absolutely right in what they believe. If you hang on to a doctrine, you are not 100% absolutely right. If you hang on to tradition, you are not 100% absolutely right. If you hang on to past religion, you are not 100% right. The only way you are 100% right is when he lives within you 100%. And that means you have no other purpose but him. Like I had said to this young man, I said, my whole life has been this way. If I don't have you, kill me now. I don't want to live. If I cannot know that you go before me and that I'm walking and talking with you, take me now because I don't want to live. There's no purpose in living. There's no purpose in doing anything. If you either straighten me up and line me up or take me because I don't want to live without you. I don't want to live without you in every thought in my mind. I don't want to live without you with every thought in my heart. I don't want to live without you. I have said that to God probably millions of times. Millions of times. And when I suffered, you think I was so perfect that I did it exactly right. No, I, by that time, I was begging him to kill me. I would fall down on the ground and roll in the dust and just lay flat on my back and look up in heaven and say, kill me now. I can't live like this. I can't endure this. I can't do this. I don't have a single person on this earth that wants to be with me, wants to talk to me, has anything. I mean, I, I was so uh, hated that I used to, I used to sit down and I watched a, a court TV one time, and I watched this really ugly old fat woman who had talked a younger man into killing somebody for her. <laughs> she at least had a family. She at least had people that loved her. And and I'm looking at her, going, "Ooh, what's wrong with me?" Not that I want anybody to do that but I mean look at the degree of power she had with them and I went oh god but you see God had a better plan he wanted me to be under the influence and power of him and him alone he was very jealous for me 
Just like he's very jealous for you. He wants all of you. He doesn't want part of you. He wants all of you. And when I didn't give it all, <laughs> you talk about spanking. I got spanked. And he would come to me and talk to me and say, Marion, you came this close to losing your soul. The mistakes and choices you were making where you would not listen to me, you almost lost it all. Now, when you know God speaks to you like that, you go, oh, wow. I mean, something inside of you wakes up. Just like I said about the time when he come and told, gave me a psalm and I said, I don't need it. I read that so many times, I already know what it says. And he did that for seven days. He brought it for seven days. And suddenly one day on the seventh day, it was like he stood before me and said, Marion, do you know? who you are talking to, that you were telling that you don't need my word. You talk about crushing me. Hit me so hard. As close as I walked with him. As many times that we had intimate things that were so great between us, spirit to spirit. There I was telling him I don't need him. It crushed me to know that I was capable of being that way and doing that. It literally, you might as well have taken my heart and broke it and ripped it in two. So what I did was is I strove for seven more days and read that psalm over and over and over all day long for seven days, looking for what? For him to speak to me. For him to tell me what he wanted to originally tell me. Over and over and over. And each time you're talking to a woman that could hear him easily. That he always talked to every day in everything. And suddenly I could no longer hear his voice. Suddenly he wasn't there anymore. Suddenly, because I had rejected him for seven days. Now, you have to look at his part. Would you have cared if you loved someone and they rejected you every day and said, ah, I don't need you? But his mercy was so great. Because after the second set of seven days of me striving, in his mercy, he began to open it up. And when he opened it up, I could not believe the revelation, the understanding, the wisdom, the power, and everything in it. I could not get enough of it. And I searched with it and worked with it for seven more days. And when I tell you I work with something, I don't do it five minutes a day. I do it all day long, every day, and all night probably sometimes. And finally, I got his message, but I learned never to do that again. If God leaves you into the part of the word that you've read a million times, go there. There's a reason. If God leads you to, to see a certain thing, whatever it is, go. There's a reason. Don't tell him you don't need him. When it comes to his word, don't ever tell him that. You'll wind up like I did, only he was merciful to me. He still drew me in. He still, from that time on, it was like I never did that. You know, he erased it. He just took it away. And like it never happened. And the only reason why I remember it is for a testimony. Every single thing in my life, is as though it never happened to me. It happened to someone else. No matter how bad it was, it, it was like it happened to someone else because he took the pain of it away. He took everything away. But he uses it to inspire people to understand how he operates, how he thinks, how he feels. And if you love him, you'll want it. Oh, will you want it? 
You, oh, will you thirst after him? Oh, there is no limit to where you would go and what you would do just for those few moments of being with him. And how many times when I would pray, and one day I said, Lord, how come I don't feel the presence of God on all my prayers? I'm close to you. Shouldn't I feel the presence of God on all of my prayers? Well, I was right. Because he was letting me know and letting me see when my prayers were of me and my prayers were according to his will. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's why I say to you people, you ask yourself, when you force your husband into submission, into believing that you have the only one that have God, and you are the only one that knows anything, and that he will never know anything, when you force him to bow his knee to what you think is God in you, ask yourself a question, is that in heaven? Thy will be done, O God, on earth as it is in heaven. I promise you, that is not in heaven. And when that husband does that with his woman, to force her into submission through prayers, you see, these are hands that manipulate. This is your prayers. They manipulate. They intimidate. They strive to get their will. And they work it that way. That's how spells are cast. That's how, because there's power. There's power in your thinking. There's power in your belief system. There's power, and you love to work that power. But if you are single-minded, single-minded with one purpose, and his name is Jesus Christ, and everything was made by him. Everything was made for him. There was not anything made that was made that was not for him. Now, when that single-minded purpose is, wherever I go, whatever I do, I will do it with all my heart, soul, strength, and mind as unto you. I won't do it for someone else. I will do it only for you. You see, I get tired. I'm as human as you are. I get tired of doing this. So-and-so doesn't appreciate me. And they I'm just like a slave to them. And I get tired and I get weary. And I get to a place where I don't want to do it anymore. That's the flesh. But if I'm doing it in the spirit the way God told me, because I, I remember the day, and, and I think I shared this before, but I remember the day that God had restored me and was slowly restoring me to make a habit. Fix your bed in the morning, get ready for your day. I had to go through that whole thing every day to make everything a habit because my life was in chaos because I had laid for so many months in bed sick. I mean, I had witnesses that saw a hole in my belly this big, that big, wide open. You could see down in it. And I was in agony. And what did God do? And I was like that for months. And, and it wouldn't heal. So what did God do when it did heal? He slowly took me and showed me the way. If you don't have organization and order in your life, and it's hodgepodge, you do this when you feel like it, you do that when you feel like it, then you have no chance to make anything a good habit. You get up in the morning, this is the first thing you do, this is the second thing you do, this is the way you do it. You don't do number two, number three until you're done with number two. And that's what he taught me. So my husband had always been this way. We're going to be married 60 years. And he was always this way. He always enjoyed getting up in the mornings, five o'clock in the morning, 
and making his own breakfast. He had just exactly how he did it. Nobody else could make it like him, and he enjoyed it, and he sat down, and he rested, and he did it. Sometimes when I was sick, I mean really sick, I would go to bed and leave the dishes because I just, so the kitchen would be a mess. And I, I just, I didn't have the strength. So I would wake up two o'clock in the morning and I would clean while he was sleeping the whole kitchen up to make sure everything was spotless and everything was ready for his breakfast. And then I would go back to bed. And I remember doing that, and I remember telling the Lord, I don't know why I'm doing this, Lord. I know you told me to do it, but why would I want to? He doesn't even appreciate it. He doesn't even notice. He doesn't even care. Why would I do this? And the Lord said to me, Marion, don't do it for him. Do it for me because I asked you to. That changed the whole picture. That taught me how. To do only for him, not anybody else. When somebody is being nasty to you and mean to you, and you stop and pay attention with that, and you engage in that, don't do that. Focus. Oh, don't focus this way so you could hurt that one. you got a problem when you do that. Because it's going to come back on you every time. Focus. What does it matter what this one says? What matters is what he says. I hope this has helped some of you because that's the only reason why I talk.